identified. I would like to briefly review the agenda for this webinar. First, I will explain how to submit a question to our presenters. Then, Rebecca Roper, Director of the Practice-Based Research Network Initiative at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC, will introduce today's presenters. We will then hear from our presenters about their experiences with stepped wedge design. We will have a question and answer session with all presenters after the final presentation. At the end of the webinar, I will explain how to obtain CME credit for participation in this webinar. Please note that after today's webinar, a copy of the presentation slides will be emailed to all webinar participants. If at any point during this webinar you have trouble hearing our presenters, please try hanging up the phone or headset and dialing back into the webinar. Please note that none of, our, none of today's presenters will discuss off-label use and or investigational use of medications in their presentations. Dr. Dickinson received some funding from the ARC INSTEP study but is not the PI. To submit a question, you may use the GoToWebinar control panel. Type a question under the Questions section and hit Send as shown in the screenshot on this slide. You may submit a question at any time throughout the presentation. During the Q&A session, as time allows, your questions will be read out loud and our presenters will respond. I will now turn the presentation over to Ms. Roper. Thank you, Christina. Um, so in the past year, among the practice-based research network community, the topic of the methodology for conducting stepwise um, design or even selecting the appropriateness of it, the design um, has been raised to us. And we were in a quest um, to find um, some presenters. And when I went to the fall uh, North American Primary Care Research Group conference, um, one, I believe it was a Sunday afternoon, I had the pleasure of watching a very detailed workshop um, that was framed by and delivered expertly um, by Dr. Dickinson, Dr. Bartlett, uh, Chris Meany, and Dr. Kwan. And they have graciously agreed to provide to us a slightly modified presentation uh, that they will give today to go over um, the, though the advanced methods, the basic elements of step wedge design and considerations in both articulating what your research objective is and um, matching that with the analytical plan and within the step wedge design. Uh, for your information, after the 90-minute uh, presentation that we will have here live, uh, which will be recorded and made available for others in a few weeks on the PBRN website. Um, this group of wonderful presenters is going to have a separate presentation that we will record and provide you to, that really provides examples of step wedge design and primary care studies. So we will look forward to um, their presentation today as well as providing you um, copies of the PowerPoint after today's presentation and an opportunity at your leisure to come back and view today's presentation as well as the supplemental material that gives uh, uh, has opportunity for more detailed examples. So as I mentioned, there are four presenters today. Um, we have Dr. Jillian Bartlett, who is Associate Professor and Research Graduate Program Director for the Department of Family Medicine in McGill University. Dr. Bartlett specializes in primary care research and knowledge translation. Her research is focused on health informatics, population health, pharmacoepidemiology, research methods, and evaluation methodologies for complex data and primary care. And I'm going to give uh, an introduction to all four presenters and then hand it over to them. Our second presenter in sequence is Dr. Miriam Dickinson, in the department, who is in the Department of Family Medicine at the Accord Center for Health Outcome Research at the University of Colorado, Denver, and senior scientist for the National Research Network of the American Academy of Family Physicians. She brings expertise in study design and the application of complex analytical methodologies to the challenges associated with practice-based research and cluster randomized pragmatic trials. Our third presenter is also from Canada. Chris Meany is a biostatistician with the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. He continues uh, to collaborate with clinicians, epidemiologists, and biostatisticians in the fields of primary care research, neurology, hepatology, and injury prevention. And our fourth presenter is Bethany Kwan, 
who is with the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She is a social health psychologist with research interest in health behavior change in primary care. Her objective with her career is to improve quality and effectiveness of behavior change interventions in primary care based on a platform of patient-centered outcomes research, healthcare informatics, and behavior theory. And having um, had the pleasure of seeing the uh, specificity and devotion that each of these uh, presenters have, though not articulated in um, their brief bios, I would say that they um, excel in their desire and capacity to articulate uh, to researchers uh, such as us um, the complexities of methodologies in such a way to inform our thought process in designing research studies and the selection of the appropriate analytical method that is matched with those research studies with an ability to understand that um, the findings have to be in a context that can be usable and translatable to all. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to um, our presenters. Miriam, Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jillian Bartlett. Oh, sorry. My name is Jillian Bartlett. I'll be um, presenting the first section with my colleague Miriam Dickinson. I'm very pleased to see so many people listening in on this webinar. Uh, this was a result of a workshop that was hosted by the Methods Working Group that is uh, one of the working groups under the Committee for the Advancement of the Science of Family Medicine. And this is a really important initiative to promote the methodologies in um, what is undoubtedly a complex area, and that is primary care. We are specifically talking today about a design that has been used extensively in practice-based research and most of that research um, within the Canadian context and, and uh, likely within the American context takes place uh, within uh, primary care and different family medicine settings. Uh, so I hope that this will be helpful for those of you taking on this uh, complex and um, advanced type of research. So if I could have the polling questions launched and if we could uh, move to the first, the next slide. Jillian, we're, or Jill, sorry, we're going to launch the poll and then when the poll concludes we'll move to the next slide. Perfect. Okay, is the polling done? Yes, so we can move to the next slide now. All right, so the question for the poll has been, I, we're trying to establish um, the audience's experience with uh, step wedge design. I see it's very nicely uh, divided. We've got a third that have no experience, um, another third that have read or heard about it, roughly a quarter or a fifth, sorry, we're planning to use it. A very small percentage have uh, used it in a study or who are currently using it in a study. So this is a, a, an interesting mix. Um, so it fits very well with our educational objectives of this uh, webinar. Uh, we are hoping that at the end of this uh, webinar you will have an understanding of the basic design of a cluster randomized step wedge trial, uh, have a better understanding of how randomization works in the step wedge design, how enrollment and measurement are done with these designs, and um, my co-presenters will be going over the implications for three design variations. We will then uh, briefly talk, uh, touch on the principles of statistical analysis for the design variation. Uh, keeping in mind one size does not fit all, we'll go into some of those details. Um, then we will be talking about 
power and sample size in step wedge design. It's, uh, that's always challenging. And finally, in the summary, we will talk about how you might select a step wedge design. And we'll do that, uh, give you some of the advantages and disadvantages of the different designs and reasons you may have for considering this. So with that, I will turn the uh, remaining part of this section over to um, my colleague, who is co-chair for the Methods Working Group, Marion Dickinson. Dr. Dickinson, are you on mute? We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Took a moment to get, get that right. Okay. So in this presentation, we're focusing on the cluster randomized step wedge design as opposed to an individually randomized step wedge design, which also exists. Uh, this design is a variation of the crossover design in which clusters cross over from the control phase of the study to the intervention phase. In PBRN studies, uh, generally clusters are primary care practices. So I'll use that inter interchangeably from here on. So in the pictures below, you can see these three common designs. Uh, the first is the parallel group cluster randomized trial, which we use a lot in PBRN research. Um, and then in, in this approach, practices are randomized to generally a control or an intervention group, and either they receive the intervention or they don't receive it. The second is uh, a traditional crossover design in which practices are randomized to an initial condi condition, usually their control or intervention again, and then they cross over at a specified time period. Now the, the cluster, the stepped wedge cluster randomized design, um, all clusters start out in the control phase. And you can see that with all the little zeros at time point one, and um, at each time point or step, one or more of the clusters crosses over to the intervention phase. And once they're in the intervention phase, they don't cross back. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Um, in the step wedge design, uh, practices are not actually randomized to a study group as they are in most of our our uh, designs, but they're randomized to an order. So we usually use something like a random number generator, which you can find in Excel or most common statistical packages to assign practices to an order. The investigator then has to decide on the number of steps, usually based on feasibility and study constraints, con constraints and a designated number of practices will cross over to the intervention phase at each step. This order determines when, not if, the practice receives the intervention. That's an important feature of the step wedge design and what distinguishes it from many other designs. By the last time block, all practices will be in the intervention phase. Um, and just one thing to mention, it, it's difficult to use blinding in this kind of approach. Next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about enrollment and measurement. Traditionally, all clusters are recruited and enrolled at baseline and followed for the entire duration of the study, but there's an alternative approach possible when retrospective data are available. We'll give examples of both. Um, outcomes are generally measured for every time block or cell, for every cluster, or in this context, for every practice. Usually, the practices participate in, in the study for the entire time period. And this can be a bit longer sometimes than a traditional parallel group cluster randomized trial. 
So in the next um, few slides, we'll highlight and dis discuss distinctions between three key variations on this design. Next slide, please. OK, the first design that we'll look at, we're, we're just calling it arbitrarily Design A, is usually referred to as a repeated cross-sectional design. And in this design, clusters cross over, but individuals are designated as either control or intervention, depending on when they're enrolled in the study. Basically, inter individuals enrolled during the control phase for that cluster are control subjects, and inter individuals enrolled during the intervention phase are intervention subjects. The key point here to keep in mind is that control and intervention groups consist of different people. And time and study is usually about the same for all individuals, regardless of when they were enrolled. Um, they may participate in the study for only a very short period of time, sometimes just a single observation, sometimes with a very short follow-up period. And in fact, in this design, if the follow-up period goes on too long, then contamination can be a problem. OK, next slide, please. OK, good. Um, in this design, which we arbitrarily call Design B, a cohort of individuals is identified at baseline and followed throughout the entire study. Um, because of um, I think we're, we're one slide too far into this. Yes, there we go. OK, that's perfect. Uh, and the distinguishing feature here is that the same individuals are in the control and intervention phases. So the clusters cross over. And when the clusters cross over, the individuals also cross over. So individuals have both control and intervention conditions. Uh, this is usually referred to as a cohort design. Uh, one of the, the features of this, and one of the difficulties sometimes, is that you have to be able to identify, track, and measure these individuals over a longer period of time. And we often use things like repeated surveys or some sort of direct measurement over time. Um, sometimes longitudinal data from uh, EHRs can work for that. Now, uh, now we're ready for the next slide. So this next one is really just a variation on design B. And in this situation, often the, and especially in the example that we'll use in a little while, uh, the, there's a larger unit of randomization, such as a geographic region. And regions cross over from control to intervention, again, based on randomization order. But the, the distinguishing and unique feature here is that because of available existing data, say from an EHR or some sort of health record, to ascertain outcomes, practices can be recruited uh, just prior to implementation of the intervention within their region and not at baseline. So that's an interesting twist on this cohort design. And again, the example we use here um, is a cohort design. The same individuals are in the control and intervention period. And individuals, as well as clusters, are followed throughout the entire study period. But they're, they're followed using electronic health records rather than having to actually involve them in the study. OK, next slide, please. So this example um, is a study. It's called the INSTEP in study, implementing network self-management tools through engaging patients and practices. And the overall goal of this study was to implement the ARC SMS library toolkit. And we had four participating PBRNs. 
So the mechanism was to use uh, something called a boot camp translation in a step wedge design. And the, the boot camp translation process resulted in tailoring the intervention for the different PBRNs. Um, and then uh, at, the, uh, at the end, the idea was to evaluate the imp impact of the intervention on patients and practice staff engaged in chronic care management. The setting was four PBRN networks, and each network contributed four practices to the study. And at the beginning, at baseline, prior to any, any work at all, the networks were randomized to an intervention initiation time or an order. Next slide, please. So here you see something like um, what we saw um, earlier. And this is just this typical design where at time block one, the, all the PBRNs and all the practices within all the PBRNs are in the control phase. At time block two, the first one switches over to intervention. The rest are in control. Time block three, we have two in the intervention phase, and so on until the last time block when all practices are in the intervention phase. Next slide, please. So um, now the, the target population here um, is patients ages 18 to 70 with chronic illness, and these pa are patients who are be being targeted for care management support. So how does this study look for patients? What we did here was during each time block, 16 patients from each PBRN are recruited and enrolled. That was about four per practice. And each patient at that time completed a baseline of one month and a two-month assessment. So that patient follow-up is fairly short. It was only about eight weeks. And that's really important for this repeated cross-sectional uh, design. And once that's done, the, the, once that follow-up is completed, um, the patients are finished. They're not involved in the study anymore. Uh, the primary outcome is the patient activation measure, or the PAM. And we were expecting this change to occur fairly quickly. Uh, so that's an important condition of this design. Uh, the patients are designated either as controls or intervention patients, depending on whether the practice was actually in the control phase or whether the practice was the in, in the intervention phase phase at the time the patient was enrolled. OK, next slide. Uh, so this slide really shows kind of the recruitment goals. And um, the patients enrolled during the control phase receive usual care. And the patients enrolled during the intervention phase receive the intervention. The intervention patients are in red in that table below. And um, something that's really important in this design is that if you don't meet recruitment goals early on or later on, then you won't have the um, right number of controls and intervention patients. So it's really important to keep practices on target with their recruitment goals. Um, what we wanted to know here was whether improvement over that two-month assessment period was greater for the intervention patients than for the control patients. So that intervention effect here in this study is a between patient effect. Next slide, please. Now, here's the statistical model that I use for this particular study. Um, and I, I tend to like to write them as multi-level models because it's clearer than exactly where the effects are, ha are happening. So within patients, we have three observations. And that's just modeled as a function of time. The level two model. Uh, first, we have the intercept as a function of the, the baseline values, 
the intervention effect, which is just the difference between intervention and control patients um, at baseline. And then we also have a temporal trend effect, that beta not 2 j times month allows us to model temporal trend. Now, what's really of interest here is the slope. And um, you'll see that in the second line of the level 2 model, where beta 1 not j is the uh, slope for control patients, and beta 1 1 j is the slope for intervention patients. And then we carry that on into the practice level models. So if you'll go to the next slide, I have a picture. Next slide, please. Yes. I have a picture of what, the, what that looks like, or at least what the hypothesized relationships look like. Um, so the blue line on the left, it's control zero, would be um, representative of the control patients during that very first time block. So they may improve a little bit. They, you know, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But we, we definitely allow for that possibility that they're going to improve a little bit over time in their PAM scores. Um, if you go over to um, one, control one and intervention one at time block one, there's a green line and a red line. So the red line uh, on the bottom represents the trajectory for control patients in time block one. So that's that first PBRN. And, um, um, the the um, first PBRN, actually the first PBRN has already switched over to the intervention phase, which is the green line, and the red line is the rest of the PBRNs. So you see there's a, a, a different slope. There's greater improvement shown in the green line, which would be the intervention patients, compared to the red line, which is the control patients. The same thing happens at the next time block. Um, there's a purple line and another blue line. The blue line is all the intervention patients in that time block. The purple line is the control patients. And again, greater improvement in the intervention patients. And finally, uh, I didn't take them all out to every time block, but finally at that very last one, which is the orange line, um, we only have intervention patients because all of the PBRNs have crossed over into the intervention phase. Now there's one more thing that's kind of interesting here. If you'll notice the starting points for each one of those time blocks is a little bit higher every time, that's, that's the temporal trend effect. Okay, next slide please. Now we're going to look at design B, and that's the cohort design. So um, in, in the cohort design, um, the same study, uh, a cohort of clinicians and staff involved in care for patients with chronic illness were recruited at baseline and followed throughout the entire period of the study. So the way we managed this was during each time block, we asked each clinician and staff member to complete a survey and uh, turn it in. And what we thought was that after the boot camp translation and the implementation of the intervention, that um, attitudes towards patients' chronic care self-management would improve. We measured that with the CSPAM. So the basic design is that clinicians and staff are in the control condition as long as the practice is in the control phase. And once the practice crosses over to the intervention conditions, the clinicians and staff also cross over into the intervention condition. And contamination is less of an issue here. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll see uh, what that looks like. So the outcome, as I mentioned, was the CSPAM, the uh, Clinician Support for Patient Activation Measure. Um, each individual has both control and intervention periods. Um, we hope to recruit at least 20 clinicians and staff 
from each PBRN and followed them throughout the study. The blue represents the control phase and the red represents the intervention phase for clinicians and staff. Okay, now let's go to the next picture. And the statistical analysis, we can use general linear mixed models again. Uh, it's parameterized a little bit differently. Uh, some key differences from the design A model is that the intervention term is actually a within individual effect. It's actually a time variant covariate. And I've, I've shown one illustration of this model below. There are some other possibilities, but in this one we've, we've seen this ha happen in some other studies. The idea is that as soon as the intervention takes place, is implemented, and in this case it's that boot camp translation, there's an immediate effect. And that's depicted by that vertical line. You see it in, uh, at the crossover point for PBRN1. Um, the trajectory stays the same, but there's this little bump up at the time that the practice crosses over and the intervention is implemented. And then you see the same thing depicted for PBRN2. There are other possibilities. Um, you could have things like change in slope. Uh, you, you could have some combination of the two. And generally, what we do is test a couple of those different possibilities and then uh, use goodness of fit criteria to determine which is the best model. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Now, um, this study, this is an interesting study. Uh, this is really this variation on design B. It's a Canadian study. It was improved delivery of cardiovascular care through outreach facilitation. And the idea is that practice outreach facilitators would work with primary care practices to opti optimize cardiovascular disease prevention and management in high-risk patients. Now, the unique feature here is that um, they randomized geographic regions in Canada to one of three intervention initiation times. There were three regions. Um, there were actually three phases to the study, which made it a little more complex. There was um, baseline and intensive intervention, and then a sustainability phase. So if you'll go on to the next slide, here's a picture of the uh, study design as depicted. And you'll have to go to the article to get more detail on it. OK, next slide. So what does this mean for enrollment and measurement? Um, the practices in each region were actually recruited prior to implementation of the intervention and not at baseline. So, in fact, they didn't have to participate from the very beginning and go all the way through to the end. And the reason that was possible was that they, there was retrospective data collection um, so it, it, they could get um, outcome variable measurement from health records, from EHR data, rather than to actually have to, having to involve the practices. Um, another feature which is a little unusual is the measurement didn't extend for the full five years. Uh, the data collection, their primary outcome was um, a quality of care composite score, and they accomplished this by doing repeated chart audits on a cohort, an identified cohort of a randomly selected patient sample. And again, there's additional detail in the article if you're interested in pursuing that. And now I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Chris Meany, who will talk about um, uh, some other analytic issues and analytic approaches, and also about power and sample size. Chris? Dr. Thank Dickinson. you very much, Miriam. And uh, just before beginning, I'd just like to thank the ARC for inviting me to speak to you all today, and thank you. Uh, to all the participants for attending the webinar as well. So 
as Miriam alluded to, um, the purpose of the next six slides is going to be to introduce and discuss a little bit more concretely a uh, popular statistical model for step wedge designs. Uh, in particular, I'm going to speak to the model that's outlined in Michael Hussey and James Hughes' 2007 Controlled Clinical Trials article, which is entitled The Design and Analysis of Step Wedge Cluster Randomized Trials. So that's one of the, the seminal articles uh, on methods for step wedge designs. Uh, so that's the reason I'm going to speak to that today. And uh, just to be a little more concrete, um, the model that I'll discuss today is one specific variant, and the, the power and sample size uh, considerations as well are applicable to this specific variant. Um, more specifically, the cross-sectional complete variant, um, where essentially patients provide a single measure at each time point J from each cluster I. So there's no repeated measures on patients in this uh, this section of the talk, um, so it's not the, the cohort model in, in any sense. So um, just building upon what Miriam introduced earlier, um, in step wedge designs, uh, all of the clusters will eventually receive the intervention, but it's the timing of the receipt of the intervention that's really different from cluster to cluster. Um, so the clusters are randomly allocated to sequences or order at which they receive the intervention. Um, and if you have uh, I guess I clusters, um, make it more concrete, say four clusters, then you'll have I plus one or five time points, where at the first time point, everybody's going to start off under control, and then as time progresses, uh, each cluster will eventually switch to the intervention until the last time point when all clusters will be in the intervention arm of the trial. Um, so yeah. Uh, what are some of the statistical issues in these kinds of designs? Basically, the main statistical issue in this type of design is that you don't have independent data. So even in the cross-sectional variant, you still have patients that are nested within clusters. So the implication of that is that people in the same cluster will essentially have responses that are more similar than would be expected under kind of an independent sampling model. The cohort variant, which uh, Miriam alluded to earlier, is even more complex, there would be a second level of hierarchy, that you basically have repeated measures nested within patients who themselves are nested within clusters. Um, I'm not going to discuss power in relation to the cohort variant. I'm going to stick to power and sample size in relation to this cross-sectional variant. So now discussing basically what we see here on the slide, um, we have a model for a response, YIJK, which is essentially modeling some response for a person K at time j from cluster i. And we're basically going to say that this response is a function of a number of parameters. And the parameters are on the, uh, the right-hand side of that equal sign. Um, and the parameters in this model by Hussey and Hughes are basically mu, which is a grand mean or an intercept, alpha i, which is a random cluster effect, uh, beta j, which is a vector of fixed time effects. So if you have t time points, will be T minus one elements in that cluster. So it's kind of just a, a simple dummy coding, setting one of the groups to zero and making your inferences about time in relation to that dummy group. And then there's the term Xij theta. And Xij is basically a vector of either zeros and ones. And the elements of the vector is equal to one if the uh, person is in the intervention group at time j from cluster i, else it's equal to zero. And theta basically is going to denote the estimated treatment effect from this model. And that tends to be the uh, parameter that most people are interested in making inferences from. And lastly, we include uh, an epsilon IJK term, which is just your basic residual noise, reflecting the fact that uh, the given points of data aren't actually going to lie completely on the plane specified by the model. So that's the model we're talking about. It's simple um, to a certain extent. And uh, it can be expanded. Uh, James Hussey suggested a couple ways to expand the model. Um, one way would be to include cluster by time interaction. Uh, another way would be to include cluster by treatment interaction. Those are going to basically capture whether or not the treatment effect varies by cluster. Uh, another possible extension might be treatment by time interaction. So that will specify whether the treatment effect varies by time. And you could also include uh, terms that might capture lag or delays in treatment effect that could be expected. 
Uh, and this well can include terms to capture possible seasonal effects if, uh, if your response has some kind of seasonality dependent in it. So again, um, this is for this model is uh, is generally for a complete cross-sectional design. Um, the statistical and power considerations would be a bit different for a cohort design. There's been a recently published master's thesis from the University of Pittsburgh on um, how you would deal with power and sample size for the cohort design as well. There's a number of extensions uh, recently published in 2015 in Stats and Med that deal with uh, other subtle extensions of the design. Uh, for example, incomplete designs where observations aren't measured uh, on every cluster or at every time point. So you can extend this model, but this is probably the most popular model that exists in the literature to date uh, for, for modeling responses from a step wedge design, and that's the one we'll, the, we'll discuss further. So if we could just advance to the next slide. So this slide has a little bit of notation, and basically what this slide does is specifies more concretely the additional assumptions that are embedded in the model discussed by Hussey and Hughes. So essentially the model on the previous slide is a linear mixed model. Um, if your response is kind of continuous Gaussian, or if it's some other response like binary or count data, it could just be a general linear mixed model. And what that essentially means is that your model includes both fixed effect terms and random effect terms. So your fixed effect terms would be things like your intercept and your fixed time effects and your, um, your estimate of the treatment effect. And there's also random effects included in the model. Um, for example, the, the random cluster effect and the residual variation. So uh, what are some of the assumptions that are embedded in this model? So one of the assumptions we make is that the random cluster effects alpha i are normally distributed with a variance tau squared um, and a mean zero. Uh, the residual noise, the epsilon ijk terms, are assumed to be distributed according to a normal distribution as well, also with a mean zero, and in this case with a variance sigma squared. Um, we further assume that the random effects are independent of the residual error, and all of these things are necessary essentially for estimation of the other model parameters. And if we make these assumptions, we can then derive things like variances that are useful for getting at kind of test statistics. And under these assumptions, we have the variance of the response being equal to the sum of the cluster effect variances plus the residual variances. So the variance of the response is equal to tau squared plus sigma squared. Um, and we can also define an intracluster correlation coefficient, which I've denoted here rho, which basically relates to the proportion of total variation that can be explained by the cluster level effects. So if we could just switch ahead to the next slide. So when we're doing a step wedge design, it's not all that different from any other kind of um, uh, trial. Usually we have a, a treatment effect, and our chief uh, target of interest is whether or not the treatment is effective or not. So under the parameterization of Hussey and Hughes' model, that basically amounts to testing whether or not theta is equal to zero, our null hypothesis, versus theta being not equal to zero, our alternative hypothesis. So one way to go about doing that when you're using kind of a regression-based approach, which we're going to propose you do, is to use a, what's called a wall statistic for inference, which is essentially just the ratio of the treatment effect over its estimate made it standard error. Um, so that wall statistic, if you have kind of a, a large-ish trial, is uh, asymptotically uh, normally distributed. Um, and it becomes uh, a pretty nice and convenient way for making inferences about whether or not that treatment effect is zero or not. So if we could just go to the next slide. Um, one thing that uh, is a little subtle in what I had just said is that one has to kind of assure that the, the trial is large enough so um, the wall test might not be entirely optimal if, the, if you don't have a large trial. Um, and in stepwise designs, that can mean a lot of things. Uh, in general, a large trial here could mean large in terms of the number of clusters recruited, large in terms of the number of time epochs that you measure responses on people, or it could mean large in terms of the number of individuals sampled from a given cluster at a given time point. So, Ideally, for this type of inferential machinery to work, you want some kind of a large, um, a large trial. Um, and uh, in Hussey and Hughes' article, they, uh, they give some very nice graphs as to how power 
varies as a function of some of those input parameters. Um, so here we're basically just saying that um, our test statistic follows a, a normal limiting distribution. And um, one of the, the challenging aspects of inference uh, for these types of models is kind of um, estimation of the variance of the, the response. And that nasty equation at the bottom of the slide was derived in the Hussey and Hughes article. Um, and it relates to the power of the study. But I won't say much more about it in terms of the mathematical nature of it. But we can switch to the next slide, and I can talk a little bit more into the intuitive nature of the equation. So power and step wedge design. What, what is influencing power in a step wedge design? There's, there's a number of factors, really, that influence power. Um, one is the strength of the treatment effect. So intuitively, if you envision your study having a large effect, um, it will have more power than a similar study with a smaller treatment effect. Uh, again, that's pretty intuitive. Um, as well, the next three bullets basically speak to the size of the study. Um, and again, size can mean a number of things in a step wedge design. It can relate to the number of clusters. It can relate to the number of time steps. It can relate to the number of participants recruited per cluster per time step. So Essentially, as you jack any of those parameters up, you're increasing the amount of information in your sample, which is going to increase the power. Um, the last thing that one might consider as well with respect to power calculations for a step wedge design is the magnitude of the variance component. Um, so that relates to the magnitude of the tau squared term and the magnitude of the sigma squared term. And the way I think about those is essentially like this. Um, sigma squared, or the, the residual error, essentially relates to noise. Um, so as you increase the sigma squared term, you're essentially increasing the variance of your response. Um, so an increase in the variance of the response is going to essentially decrease uh, the magnitude of your test statistic and decrease your power. Um, and then the other term is the, the tau squared term, which is your variance of your cluster level effect term. Um, and the way I think about that is, again, kind of related to information. Um, the extent to which that rises relates to the extent to which people within the same cluster look more and more alike. Um, and as people from the same cluster look more and more alike, you are actually decreasing the amount of effective um, individual information that you've uh, been able to recruit in your sample. So as that increases, power will also decrease in your study. Um, another interesting feature that Hussey and Hughes investigate is that of uh, lag times between treatment effects. And in general, if you expect a long lag between the application of your intervention until that uh, treatment effect is realized, you're also going to have uh, lesser power compared to if that treatment effect is realized immediately after its introduction. So um, really, power and step wedge designs is a complicated um, matter. Uh, as this slide kind of points out to, power is really a function of a number of parameters, although um, some of them investigators should be able to get at given their specific study. For example, um, resources, funding deadline, size of the community, et cetera may impose certain restraints on the number of clusters, the number of time points, the number of individuals that one could recruit. Um, so that isn't necessarily an entirely free parameter in estimating sample size. If you're able to um, specify uh, a small number of points on a discrete grid, um, you should be able to get, uh, get at certain estimates of how power varies as a function of those inputs. Um, as well, uh, Investigators should have some idea of the effect size that one would expect given the intervention they plan to, uh, to introduce. So that should be, um, should be not too hard to get at. What tends to be the hardest uh, parameters to estimate are the, the variance components for the, uh, for the residual errors and the variance components for the cluster level effects. Um, when I'm doing sample size calculations for these sort of things, I'll usually liaise with my clinical colleagues and try to get them to specify uh, a range of plausible values for each of these input parameters. And then essentially just calculate power as a function of um, 
all, all possible combinations of these points and then essentially plot out how power varies as a function of these input parameters. And in fact, that's what Hussey and Hughes did very well in their seminal article as well. So uh, if we could just switch to the next slide, I'll just discuss some of the analytic options for step wedge design. So the model that we just recently discussed is uh, really a linear mixed model. And if you have uh, non-normal outcomes, you could extend that to a generalized linear mixed model. Um, Another approach is a generalized estimating equation model. In general, these can be described as regression-based approaches to deriving inference for treatment effect. Um, the models are slightly different. Um, there's subtle distinctions between the GE approach to inference and the GLMM approach to inference. Really, in GE, the correlation between um, individuals in a cluster would be viewed as a nuisance and we essentially are going to estimate marginal effects of treatment in the population um, after kind of acknowledging the fact that we, we treat the correlation structure as a nuisance and estimate that um, separately for treatment effects. Conversely, under kind of a general linear mixed models approach that Miriam had introduced earlier, the correlation may be viewed as more interesting, and you may want to estimate treatment effects conditional on random effects included in the model. Neither, they're probably two of the most popular approaches to analyzing step wedge design, and they're probably two of the most modern approaches to analyzing step wedge design. Neither is really right or wrong, and the choice between GE versus GLMM really is going to depend on the type of inferences study investigators want to make about treatment effects from their, from their research project. Um, one thing, though, to consider about the GE approach is that um, Typically, GE is used if there's a single level of clustering. So it would apply well to the design that Hussey and Hughes specified, where you have individuals from within a given cluster. And that's, your, that's the dependency structure that's imposed. If you have a more complicated design, like the cohort design, where you have repeated measures nested within individuals, nested within clusters, and now you have multiple layers of dependency, GE um, can be used. But uh, the availability of software solutions for GE under kind of multi-level design is limited to a little bit. Um, so yeah, why do we need to use GE and GLMM? Essentially, it's because the data are clustered from a step wedge design. Um, for more complex designs with higher levels of clustering, it's even more um, important that you use the proper methodology, something like GE or GLMM to properly account for the non-independent response data. Um, that said, when you're reading through the literature, other um, options might exist, or you might encounter other options for analyzing this type of step wedge data. Um, a simpler alternative might be to try to adjust estimates of treatment effect by some estimate of the design effect from your study. This was once very popular, but as kind of uh, GE and DLMM have become more broadly available to the research community, it's being used to a lesser extent. Um, another analytic alternative is to basically collapse the data um, for individuals to that of a single cluster and time effect. Um, that is also kind of a little less popular. It's less powerful because you essentially lose information by collapsing individual data to cluster level data. Um, as well, it doesn't. It, it kind of negates the possibility to adjust for individual level factors in the model. Another approach would be to estimate treatment effects in the presence of kind of robust standard error approaches, something like Huber White adjusted standard errors. Um, a challenge with that is that one needs kind of large cluster sizes in order to achieve optimal performance. So, from my perspective, GE and GLMM are becoming more popular and probably will continue to become more popular research methods in the years to come. And those would be what I would recommend for analyzing uh, step wedge trial data. So yeah, we basically introduced the most popular statistical model for inference in step wedge designs that you'll probably encounter in the literature. That's the model of Hussey and Hughes. The main statistical issue relates to correlated response data. Um, the model is relatively simple, but as Hussey demonstrated, it can be extended in multiple ways. And in general, I would say the literature on step wedge designs is really in its infancy. Anecdotally, I really see many methodological papers published each month or year. And uh, clearly, step wedge designs have immense clinical utility.
Um, and that's why methodological um, thought is increasing in that area. So thank you, and I'll pass the floor over to uh, Stephanie. I think before we move on to Bethany, we just wanted to launch two quick polls um, from Dr. Dickinson's presentation. So, Dr. Dickinson, would you like to introduce those polls? Uh, yes. Um, can you put them up on the screen? Okay. So this is really oriented towards the design. Um, so the first one, if you have a, a practice-based intervention, to enhance care coordinations for patients with type 2 diabetes to improve hemoglobin A1C over time, which design would you choose? Would it be repeated cross-sectional or cohort? So please vote. Think about what we talked about in that section. The results uh, are up on the cohort yeah. design. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would tend to choose. And the reason is that it takes longer to observe the effect generally. Now, you know, you could argue that and, and look at the time frame and everything and perhaps make the other one work. But, but the, the time element is what's important here. And the, the amount of time required to observe an intervention effect. Let's go to the next one. OK. Um, now, this is a slightly different kind of problem to study a pre-visit parent education intervention on initial HPV vaccination uptake in teens at their first eligible visit. Which design would you choose? Okay, this one's very clear. Doesn't seem to be much doubt about that. Uh, repeated cross-sectional is what's commonly used for these kinds of outcomes. Uh, generally, just a single time point at that visit, did they get vaccinated or not. Uh, but these help you think about the implications of uh, study design and what your outcome is, what you're trying to achieve, and how long it'll take you to achieve it. OK, shall we pass over to Bethany? Yes, hello. OK, um, thank you all for, uh, for coming today. And hope you're, you're still with us and uh, paying attention. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, how do you go about making the decision to use a stepped wedge design? How do you know that this is something that is a good idea for your research question? So typically. Um, people use the stepped wedge design to evaluate therapies, treatments, interventions when really withholding that intervention from some participants, you know, from a control group, um, would not be acceptable or, or, really, fee or really feasible. Um, so we often see this in working with practices, with communities that they say, that in this, we really think this intervention is going to do some good. And we don't think that we can really hold it back. It's not acceptable to us. And so a stepped wedge design is one of several designs that you could use um, in that particular circumstance because all of the clusters do eventually um, get the intervention. Now, we know in, 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 um, in that design A, there are still individual people that do not get the intervention, uh, but their practices do ultimately, their communities do ultimately get that intervention. Um, to also, typically, um, the step wedge design is used to examine effectiveness um, or impact in real world settings at the population level. Uh, no, go, go back, we're not there yet. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> um, the, it, it's not really it not, it's not an efficacy trial. So this is not what you would use if you were not sure if the intervention you were using was really going to be efficacious at the individual level. 
Um, so specifically, if your intervention is shown to be effective in a more controlled research setting, and now you're ready for a more large-scale pra pragmatic trial, a dissemination implementation type of trial, a step to which would be a good option. Also, um, and relatedly, uh, if there, there's lack of this definitive evidence of effectiveness, but really a belief that the intervention will do more good than harm. Um, so a couple examples of that might be the use of care management or care coordination. Um, you wouldn't necessarily anticipate that, um, that providing a person to do care coordination would be harmful in any way. Um, so that's just an example of that. Okay, now next slide. Okay, um, so what are some of the specific motivations that people have mentioned in the literature for selecting the stepped wedge design? So given that they're doing this effectiveness or impact trial, um, why stepped wedge amongst other sorts of you know, pragmatic trial types of designs? Um, and the motivations really fall into two categories, one being practical considerations and one being an ethical consideration. So from a practical consideration, um, let's say you, you really need to do your implementation and your randomization at the cluster level, so at the practice level, at the hospital level, at the community level. Um, so if your intervention is something that is changing the way that care is delivered, it doesn't make sense to try to change the way that care is delivered for individual patients within a practice and require the practice to deliver care in two different ways. So really they need to, the whole practice needs to, uh, to, to switch over to the intervention. Um, another practical consideration is if all um, if all clusters must or will receive the intervention. So sometimes this is really outside of your control. Um, sometimes a community or a state or a large organization has decided that they are going to implement an intervention um, one way or the other, <laughs> and they will work with you to randomize the time at which that happens so that you can utilize this uh, particular design, but it is not acceptable to them that clusters will never get the intervention. Um, this, this can really help increase acceptability to the community of using a randomized design. So as we noted, um, um, these clusters are randomized to when they will get the intervention, not if. Um, and sometimes that's enough to, um, to get the community or your cluster to agree. Um, to even that much randomization. Um, another practical consideration is when you really need phased or sequential implementation. So a lot of our research teams are implementation teams of just a few people, and unfortunately we cannot be in um, many places all at once as much as we try. Um, so you just can't really roll out the, the intervention simultaneously across large groups of practices. So in a cluster RCT, you have 20 practices. Everybody's due to get the intervention right at the beginning or the control. Uh, you really can't you know, roll out an intervention in some cases in all 10 practices, especially when it's a much more complex intervention, um, like what Marion was describing for INSTEP. Um, uh, another reason that um, a phased or sequential implementation may be desirable um, is that you, in step what you, you can do sort of quality improvement of the intervention or its delivery before the next implementation phase. So if you realize um, in an earlier phase, in an earlier wedge, or earlier step, <laughs> that things are not working terribly well and you want to try to improve some of the delivery of the intervention, you have an opportunity to do that. Um, so, go to the next page, please. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, there are also some ethical considerations uh, for selecting a stepped wedge. Um, this is consistent with the reason why people tend to use this design. So number one, the intervention is really believed to do more good than harm. Um, that is this, this concept of, of equipoise, of clinical equipoise is really minimal. Um, and equipoise is this idea that as long as there is genuine uncertainty about the most beneficial treatment, um, there, there is really no ethical imperative to provide the better intervention to everyone. Um, but in this case, we've said, like, we really think that there, the intervention is, it will do more good than harm. And so it really isn't ethical to randomize people or randomize clusters to not get the intervention. Um, so really, we assume that it would be unethical to withhold the intervention uh, because it is there is there, because there is established effectiveness, or we know it to be a gold standard. It's just not being implemented well. 
Um, also, for an, another ethical consideration is once the intervention is implemented, it's not removed. So you don't take it away. Um, you don't force people to go back to a pre-intervention um, time point. Next slide, please. Okay. So those were all the, the motivations and reasons to use Stepped Wedge. What are some cautions? I, I, I think you probably picked up on a lot of these as you were listening um, to my colleagues give their parts of the presentation. That are, um, we just want to, to caution you or make sure you're aware of some of the considerations when selecting this design. I, I don't know that I would call them cons so much as just something to be aware of. Um, so the, the stepped wedge can be more difficult, more complex certainly, than a traditional parallel group randomized clinical trials. Um, one of the things that has given me pause in the past is this um, sort of really heavy data collection burden. Um, as you noted, outcomes need to be measured for every cluster at every time point. Um, so that, that data collection burden can cause increased costs to you as the researchers. Um, it certainly adds a lot of data that you need to um, protect, gather, um, bring into your own um, environment to analyze. And it's certainly a large data burden to your, the practices or the clusters that they need to work with you um, every time to gather that data. Um, and, and it's always the case that informed consent can be um, challenging in step to wedge design given this data collection burden. Uh, if you do need to get informed consent, that can be especially difficult. Uh, but this burden can be minimized if the data that you're using come from existing sources of routinely collected data, such as electronic health records or public health surveillance systems. Um, so maybe that need for a lot of data doesn't matter if you are able to get your outcomes data from these existing sources. Um, something else that's been mentioned previously and just want to bring into this, um, the, these ca this list of cautions is the, the idea that your trial can be very long if, you're, if there's a complex um, implementation. So anytime we're trying to change the way practices deliver care, um, change workflows, that can take a very long time. Um, to, to actually put into place in the practice. It's a little bit different from changing perhaps a prescribing um, regimen, um, just changing the, the type of medication that people use. Um, or um, the, the trial duration can also be long if it takes a very long time for the intervention to influence outcomes. Um, so, for instance, um, weight loss interventions can certainly take a very long time um, to actually have an effect on outcomes. People need to participate in an intervention sometimes that you know, takes more than just one visit. Um, and even when you have been able to implement your intervention, you may not have time to observe effects on your clinical outcomes, especially in design A. Um, so, for instance, it can take several months to observe a change in uh, hemoglobin A1C. Okay. Um, a, a couple other cautions. Um, there, regarding internal validity, there's a greater potential for contamination, especially in Design A. Um, Mary mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, she also mentioned some um, challenges regarding sequence generation and allocation concealment. Um, you, you can sometimes do blinding of outcome assessors, but that's not always possible. Uh, and then finally, it can be an impractical design if you're comparing multiple interventions. So um, for instance, if you have multiple levels of an intervention, so you, you have a control group and then you have a minimal intervention group and then a more intensive intervention, um, it, that doesn't really work very well. Um, it works better if you have just two different interventions that you're comparing or intervention versus a, a usual care or control. All right, so next slide. Okay, so um, as, as I mentioned earlier, there are other types of cluster designs that you can use. Um, and how do you really differentiate the stepped wedge design from a more traditional parallel group, group cluster randomized trial? And really the key difference is this idea of a crossover, that every cluster gets the intervention in stepped wedge design, where in parallel group you're either intervention or control during the trial itself. Um, as I mentioned before, there's the stepped wedge design has a longer trial duration, certainly compared to the parallel group cluster randomized trial. 
and why you can do sequential implementation and roll out um, uh, implementation and roll out of the inter intervention in both designs. Um, step to watch design really allows for more of a stepped implementation, step by step, um, in in a more systematic way. Um, and then finally, um, while both the designs can be used to examine temporal effects, um, stepped wedge design you can control for temporal trends analytically uh, using those um, wonderful analytic approaches that Chris just described for us. Um, and in a parallel group cluster RCT, you can have a parallel control group to assess a temporal trend. Um, but the stepped wedge design can really be better if, you're, if you have concerns about history or seasonality effects that you want to examine longitudinally. Um, so you can, you can make sure that you have a time factor incorporated into your analytic approach in, in a stepped wedge design for sure. Okay. All right, next slide. Okay. So in summary, the ideal circumstances for utilizing stepped wedge are when you have questions about reach, effectiveness, or impact at a population level and implementation, um, when you have a focus on shorter term outcomes, um, especially design A. Um, so as I already mentioned, clinical outcomes can take a little bit longer to have an effect, but if you're looking at behavioral outcomes, at process or, media, or intermediate outcomes, so for instance, how many people are receiving self-management support, how many people are receiving counseling um, for some type of behavior change, um, how many people are being offered a new toolkit for managing their asthma, something like that. Uh, that's a more process or intermediate outcome, are people receiving the intervention. Um, and other designs, so we, we talked about design B, and, when, and there was a, we used to be called design C, uh, but we changed it to be a variation on design B. Um, you can, in those cases, you can accommodate longer times um, to observe an intervention effect. Um, but certainly in design A, um, we recommend focusing on shorter term outcomes. And then also an ideal circumstance for stepped wedge um, over and above a, a group, a, a parallel group cluster randomized trial is when you have fewer clusters available. So as we mentioned, um, because of the repeated measures uh, in a stepped wedge design, you can utilize fewer, fewer clusters and, and have more power. Um, so if you only have eight to ten clusters available, for instance, a stepped wedge design can be a great option for you. Okay. Um, and so that's it for me. Um, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Jill at this point. Thank you, Bethany. Okay, so we're going to launch our final poll for this webinar, and I'm going to wrap up very, very quickly so that we can get into question and answers. So um, I'm interested in knowing, or we're interested in knowing, what would be your main motivation for using Step Wedge if you're planning to use it? Um, so you can select one of the answers there, and we'll look at the polling results. Okay, so it seems that it's uh, coming through that it really is the best method for your study. Um, it's interesting that's more than half the people are picking that. There is that uh, concern about ethical issue in equipose. And then there are those of you like myself that really like the method and want to explore using it. Um, I, I imagine there's a few biostatisticians in that group. It's very fascinating method. So. Um, We've learned a lot about the step wedge design, and I'm going to go right into the, the concluding slide. So next slide, please. Okay, so um, at the end of this seminar or webinar, you should basically have come to the conclusion that although it is not always the best design, and I think Bethany gave a very nice summary of what situations it does and doesn't work in, um, what is really appealing about this, especially for practice-based research, is that a potentially beneficial intervention can eventually be offered to all participating practices or community. And this really helps you when you're trying to engage those practices in your intervention research. Um, the other point is it really is, and in terms of ethics, when there isn't equipose. In other words, we're pretty sure that this intervention is going to be beneficial 
uh, it makes sense to, to try this uh, design, keeping in mind the limitations for the timeline for your outcomes. So I wanted to thank um, all of my uh, co-presenters on this, and they also did a fantastic job as part of the workshop. And the, uh, as co-chair of the Methods Working Group, we're really proud of this product. And I believe we can go to the question and answer session. So thank you all very much. Um, uh, some of the um, questions have come in with responses, and we will, we will be sharing them. Um, Christina, if you could go to slide 25, and while you were going there uh, as it relates to a question that's been posed, uh, someone asked, inquired as to which software packages, um, in addition to SAS, um, and particularly as SPSS, um, has this type of functionality under it. And Chris shared that it is available under SPSS version 22 under the Analyze tab, a mixed method. Is there anything else you care to share with the group, Chris, with respect to um, availability of um, uh, pre-programmed step wedge? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think there's anything really out of the box that you could just throw data at uh, from a step wedge design and just get inferences directly out of. But um, as generalized estimating equations and generalized linear mixed models become more mainstream in biomedical research, um, software begins to adopt these methods. So I, I don't know how long ago it would have been that SPSS added them, but SPSS should have solutions for that, as does SAS, as does R, as does STATA, as do many of the, the large software packages for conducting um, statistical analysis of trial data. Great. Thank you. So the question came up at about the time that uh, the slide is before us. Are all patients enrolled just at the beginning or at each time point where one group is crossing over? And um, Chris, would you um, like to provide the group your answer? And then um, perhaps Dr. Dickinson, if you want to um, add any uh, additional reflections? Yeah, sure. The answer I shared over the webinar was essentially one of it depends. Um, if you're, you could do it either way. One design variant that Miriam introduced is one where um, you recruit patients, uh, independent patients, at each time step from each cluster. So that would be more of a cross-sectional variant, whereas a different design, which Miriam introduced, is more of a cohort variant where you recruit uh, a fixed number of people at the beginning of the study and follow them longitudinally at time. Uh, and there's yeah. more variants on each of those and uh, kind of gave a reference to, uh, to a useful paper published, I think, January 2015 in Stats and Meds that uh, should help uh, elucidate some of the distinction between the cohort variants and the cross-sectional variants, some of the other variants. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Miriam. I, I, Chris, you described that very nicely. Um, it depends on the design. And the repeated cross-sectional, generally patients, clusters are followed throughout the study, uh, but patients are recruited um, during during each time block. And so you might have a, a situation for design A where you, you, each practice has to recruit, say, 10 patients, 15 patients per time block. And these are new patients. These are different patients, not the same ones. In design B, um, in the traditional approach, you would recruit everyone at the beginning and follow them all the way through. And then when the cluster crosses over, the patient crosses over. Um, in the situations where you can ascertain outcomes from existing data, then you don't have to do it exactly that way. You, you can um, you can look back and get retrospective assessment of their control period. And that's, um, on this slide, design B. Um, in this case, we recruited clinicians and staff at the beginning and surveyed them once during each time block. But you can imagine if you have uh, EHR data, it, it would just take looking at the um, 
clinical measures during the control and the intervention phases. So that's the big distinction between those two uh, approaches, the cohort and the repeated cross-sectional. Thank you. And um, Christina, if you could go to slide 30, a general statistical model for a step wedge design. The question is, is um, with respect to the variance of responses, um, and the question is posed as follows. I understand that the independence assumption of the random cluster effects and the residual error makes the calculation of power sample size easier, but how realistic is it? If one can assume this, could we use another method for estimating this variance, the delta method, bootstrap, or something else? Um, Dr. Dickinson, or does anyone care to respond? Um, generally, I'm, I'm going to ask Chris to also jump in here. Um, certainly, you could use some bootstrapping approaches. Uh, that would be a possibility. Um, I, in in my experience, I have generally used the formula that Hussey. Um, recommends on the other slide for estimating variance, and that has worked pretty well for uh, both dichotomous kinds of outcomes, yes, no, so where you're looking at proportions and continuous outcomes. Um, it, it's a little complex because you have clusters, so you have individuals within clusters, and then you, you also have the time effect, so it's a uh, the ICC generally refers to individuals within clusters, but you have this time block effect as well. Um, and um, I think the Hussey approach works pretty well. Um, there are several of us who have tried it successfully. Chris, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I was going to take a crack at responding to it, but I, I don't think I have a perfect answer myself. Um, I think the bootstrapping approach that you alluded to using is a, is a sensible option. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, the, the independence assumption, I, I believe, in my opinion, is used uh, basically as a mathematical nicety so that um, when you're uh, deriving some of these power and sample size formulas, things work out a little nicer. Um, in the example, I guess you, you suggested, what if we cannot assume that the, uh, the cluster level uh, random effects are independent of the residual error? I suppose that's a, a reasonable assumption that might arise in data modeling. Um, but my, my guess at why Hussey and Hughes didn't go that way um, in their paper would just be it would make things a little more difficult. Um, Specifically, I guess you would have to specify the magnitude and the direction, or just in general, a functional form for the relationship um, between the residual variances and the cluster level, um, the variances of the cluster level effects. And it would just add a, 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 it's not that it couldn't be done, I think it would just add a layer of complexity to it um, that wouldn't generalize as uh, nicely as what they do here. I agree, Chris. I, I think it would be more difficult. The bootstrapping might work the best. Um, uh, and when you have correlated residuals, um, that you could perhaps incorporate that. But that, that's difficult. Um, that makes it far more complex than, um, than it already is, which is pretty complex. Agreed completely, Miriam. And that's kind of what I was thinking. Uh, like the idea of heteroscedastic kind of residual variances might have come into play, whereas if uh, you if you thought you knew the form of how the magnitude of the um, the cluster level variances or the predicted cluster random effects kind of influence the magnitude of the residual, you could maybe go into modeling that. But I don't think um, that's a a general solution. It would have to be specific to the data at hand, I believe. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but for, before I do, I just want to remind folks, at the conclusion of this um, presentation, there will be instructions on how you can receive um, CE credit. 
and I'll ask one question, and then I'm going to execute a poll uh, for you to evaluate um, the webinar honestly. But we need to demonstrate, uh, not to bias your response, um, the extent to which these type of activities are successful or not. So um, we have to show data to, to show in order to demonstrate support. So, but before I get there, another question was posed: Do we need to balance? the data like using propensity score matching. And Dr. Kwan, this question was posed midpoint of your presentation. So would you care to take a crack? If you're speaking, Dr. Kwan, we're not able to hear you. Sorry, I, I was on mute. It took me a while to get to that little point there. Um, so do we need to balance the data? like using propensity score matching. I actually think this is more of, a, of an analytic approach. I, I, I haven't heard of anyone doing this. Have you, Miriam or, or Chris? Well, actually, we have paid attention to, in the randomization process to mm. stratification variables so that you don't inadvertently get very different practices uh, starting earlier in the process as far as uh, intervention implementation versus later. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have used that in a few situations to make sure that that hap doesn't happen and mainly use stratification approaches where we require um, uh, either similar practices or very different practices to either be closer together in the top half or the bottom half of the order. Um, but we do it that way. So yes, that, that can be an issue. Um, mm -hmm. And I think more work needs to be done in this area. There hasn't been a lot of work done in this area. All right, thank you. So I'm going to execute one of our polls. And in the meantime, um, if um, Christina, you could go to slide 22 um, that has the chart, and that'll be, we'll speak about that for a bit. So, ah. <laughs> um, so the question was posed um, uh, with respect to um, whether or not one should actively try to improve the inter intervention with each successive group. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Um, so this probably goes back to the point I, I was making that you can use sort of quality improvement um, types of approaches as you um, as, as you roll out the intervention, and and I would say that th this is something you should do um, cautiously. Um, it, it sort of depends on the purpose of your research. Um, so I, I don't know that you that I would recommend changing your intervention. Um, but you might improve the implementation of your in, of your intervention. So if you're finding that um, by trying to implement your intervention um, on paper, um, but it's really just not working well, you're not getting um, you know, good good uptake of using the intervention on paper, um, and you felt like you wanted to switch over to a web-based approach to delivering your intervention. Uh, there are a variety of types of interventions for which that might be relevant. Now, that's something you, you may consider. Or maybe you recommend that instead of having the intervention implemented by a clinician, that you have the intervention implemented by a navigator or a staff person. Um, so those kinds of changes, depending on your research question. Um, so if your research question is, you know, does having an, uh, a clinician in, implement this intervention um, lead to good implementation? Well, then you know you wouldn't want to change that. Um, but you can do some tweaks regarding implementation as long as it isn't the the basis of your research question. Thank you. So now I'm going to uh, launch the poll. We'll launch our two polls. Whether or not these types of webinars are a trusted source of information around practice improvement and practice transformation. And uh, just as a post note, when you exit this particular webinar, you'll be asked to assess the um, uh, the value and the extent to which the content met your needs. So that's another, uh, your completion of those assessments would be um, uh, greatly appreciated. And um, while this is executing, 
um, I'll just let the uh, presenters know um, the, uh, this other question, then we can be prepared to um, answer it. Um, or, um, if your main outcome is a six months follow-up call, do you have to collect data at each crossover time point, or can you collect just baseline data at S1, then data at each time point for the only, uh, only for the cluster that crosses over then, and finally a third time point six months after the crossover for each respective cohort? Yeah, so as we, we mentioned, one of the considerations for a stepped wedge design is the time it takes um, for your main outcome to be realized. So if it takes six months from the time that your intervention is delivered at an individual patient level, for instance, um, and, and, and you had four, or five, or six um, steps um, at which the different clusters would cross over to the intervention, you would have a minimum um, interval for your step of six months. So you would have a very long trial. I would not recommend utilizing stepped wedge for, um, for a study in which you, your main outcome takes six months to be realized and measured. This okay. is Miriam. I'll jump in very briefly. Um, I echo that. Um, and you have to keep separate in this repeated cross-sectional design the idea of individual follow-up and cluster measurements because they're really two different things. So if individuals, the issue here is if individuals have to be follow-up for six months and you want to do this repeated cross-sectional, there is the risk of contamination when the cluster crosses over. And most, peop most uh, investigators are going to have a hard time protecting patients um, say in a practice where the cluster has already crossed over from uh, the intervention. And so that, that's the big issue there. But in, the, in this design, patient follow-up is one thing and cluster crossover and cluster time blocks are, are another issue entirely. In the cohort design, you've got the same individuals from beginning to end. But that's not the case in this repeated cross-sectional where a cluster crosses over, but you're usually recruiting a new set of patients at each time block and then following all the patients regardless of the time block for about the same period of time, you know, two months, one month, six months, which is kind of long. Um, so does that answer that, I hope? Yes, I thought that was very good. I want to thank you all. Um, for those who want to obtain CME credit, the instructions are on the screen right now. Um, and our wonderful presenters are going to have about a five-minute break and put together a detailed example that we will, uh, examples that we will share with you um, via the Internet. Um, but I thank you all very much. And I thank um, the audience members who um, pose such thoughtful questions. And on a Friday afternoon, um, spoke Greek with the best of them. And so thank you very much. And I just uh, want to um, let people know that the PBRN community is open and welcome new members. So if you care to join our listserv, um, please do. Please email, email us at pbrnlist at list.arc.gov. And actually, we will have our next webinar on March the 4th with Larry Green and James Werner and Rebecca Etz to really talk about um, where PBRNs are today, how they're fostering partnerships for pragmatic and prompt resolutions, and uh, leveraging the development of uh, research collaborations. But it's been a pleasure um, to uh, listen to Dr. Dickinson and Chris and um, Dr. Bartlett and Dr. Kwan. I, we thank you all very, very much. Um, is there anything else, Christina? I, I'll just launch the final two polls for those of us who are still participating. If you could just quickly vote, um, we really appreciate your feedback. So we'll just hold, we'll keep this up for uh, about 10 more seconds. Um, thank you, and one more.
So we really appreciate your feedback. It looks like we're getting a lot of responses. Thank you all so much for taking the additional 10 minutes to stay with us. Uh, so I'll close this poll, and that's all we have. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. Thank you all.